um, to start the afternoon session for in the honor of Professor Orevkov. And the first speaker is Stanislav Speransky, who is now working at the Steklov Mathematical Institute in Moscow. Um, so I checked a bit the CV, and Stanislav has, um, Professor Speransky has won several important grants, uh, many important uh, invited talks, and uh, there's even a cooperation with the Uni University of Ghent with uh, uh, Diedrich Barth. And so it's uh, nice to, to have him in. And uh, he will speak today on a constructive interpretation of independence quantifiers. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to give a talk at such an event, given the importance of results obtained by St. Petersburg School of Mathematical Logic, and in particular of contributions of Vladimir Arifkov to constructive math. As for my talk, it was originally intended to be about constructive game theoretical interpretation of some well-known logic with generalized quantifiers and related realizability interpretation. However, I've come to think that it's too much for a 15 minutes talk, so it may be more instructive to make this talk as accessible as possible, kind of a survey talk, and to advertise certain ideas, leaving generalizations and related technical details for a different occasion. So what I'm gonna do is to use the framework of ordinary first order logic rather than of the more general logic. Sorry, there is some terrible noise in the voice of the speaker. Okay, so maybe it's, it's, it's on my side. So I, I'll try to go to a different room. Oh, is it better now? No, not really. Not really. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'll just try to be a little bit louder. Um, yeah, we cannot do so, much. So I'll try to do that in the framework of um, ordinary first order logic in order to present some ideas and advertise the topic. So hopefully, it will make this talk easy to follow. Um, well, still, I've mentioned some uh, logic that generalizes first order logic. So namely, uh, I meant so-called independence-friendly first order logic, or if for for short. Now, this logic extends first order logic, or rather its implication-free fragment, because we shall be concerned with game theoretical semantics and there is no standard uh, way of interpreting implication within this semantics. So it extends first order logic in the following way. Syntactically, we need to add expressions of this form where X capitalized is a finite set of variables. So these are called so-called, these are called independence quantifiers. Then adopting the standard game theoretical conventions, we pass from games with perfect information to those with imperfect information. So uh, when we deal with games with imperfect information, what it means is that at each point in the game, the player, the current player, knows all the moves that have led to the current position. Now, for games with imperfect information, it's not, it's not longer the case. And the point is that for each occurrence of this independence quantifier, we assume that a choice of value for that small x does not depend on the choice of values for the variables in x capitalized. So that's the intuition. According to Hintika, this more general logic, independence-friendly logic, emphasizes the descriptive function of logic as opposed to its deductive function. Now, it will take at least one additional talk to explain what that is supposed to mean, but briefly stated, the intuition is the following. Since we already have some generalized quantifiers, uh, something has to go. So independence-friendly logic is no longer deductive because, I mean, the validity problem for that logic will be sigma one one complete. So it cannot be axiomatized in the usual way. On the other hand, it has some nice features 
that first order logic lacks. So for instance, we all know uh, the so-called Tarski's undefinability of truth theory, right? That the truth predicate for uh, the standard model of arithmetic is not definable in the language of arithmetic. It's not longer the case for independence friendly first order logic. So the truth predicate uh, in this language for the standard model will be definable in the language itself. So, and there are some other nice features that may have some nice effects on, the on formal theories of truth, at least from a model theoretic perspective. But I will not go uh, uh, into detail here. Now, suppose that sigma is a signature or a first order language, which is just a collection of predicate function and constant symbols as usual. And we also have some sigma structure, which is just a non-empty set supplied with an interpretation of the symbols in sigma. And we also have an assignment. Well, I will assume that this is a partial assignment. So it's a partial function from the variables to the domain of D, right? Now, in the game theoretical semantics, for each implication free first to the formula phi, whose free variables are in the, in the domain of S, so we know the values for all these variables, right? We define a certain game denoted G of D, S, and phi with perfect information. I will not do that formally. Again, it will require a few more slides, but I mean, the intuition is pretty simple. There are only two players, LAs and Abelard. So LAs, well, roughly, uh, LAs stands for existential quantifiers and Abelard stands for universal quantifiers, right? So initially one can think of them as playing the roles of verify and falsify respectively. During the game, they may switch their roles, however. So briefly stated, Disjunctions and universal quantifiers are decision points for LAs. Conjunctions and universal quantifiers are decision points for Abelard. And each negation indicates the role reversal of the players. So the falsifier, the current falsifier becomes the verifier and the other way around. Well, and now we write like that. We use the following notation to indicate that the original verifier, that is LAs, has a winning strategy in the corresponding game. Or one may say that there exists a positive winning strategy for that game. Well, and also with minus, we'll say that uh, there exists a negative winning strategy for that game. So it's just classical stuff. Now, again, negation here indicates the role reversal of the players. So there exists a positive negative, uh, there exists a positive winning strategy for not phi, if and only if there exists a negative winning strategy for phi. Well, and the other way around, of course. And it turns out that this semantics is equivalent to the compositional one. What it means is that for every implication free first of the formula, whose free variables are in the domain of S, we have this equivalence that there exists a winning strategy for LAs in the corresponding game if and only if phi is true classically in D under S. I mean, here, this is just the classical, the Tarskian style, the Tarski style um, forcing relation, right? Of course, I mean, game theoretical semantics is much more accurate in a way because uh, each winning strategy is a kind of way of realizing truth. Maybe not constructively, but still, I mean, there may be different ways of showing that truth. So there may be different winning strategies and all of them demonstrate that the formula is true. Well, in particular, the law of excluded middle will be valid in the game theoretical semantics for first order logic, but it, of, of course it's not obvious, right? Because the law of excluded middle means that one of the players, one of the two players necessarily uh, has a winning strategy, which is of course not obvious, right? 
I mean, that the law of exploded middle is valid in uh, the Tarski style semantics is obvious, while for the game theoretical semantics, it is not obvious. It relies on some restricted version of Gale Stewart theorem, of course. So the point is that if you will extend your syntax a little bit and allow for games with imperfect information, or if you restrict the, uh, the notion of a strategy, then the law of excluded middle may easily fail, of course. And we'll see how that happens later on. Now, further, for each independence-friendly formula, we can define a similar game, but now with imperfect information, while well, taking into account the intended meaning of independence quantifiers. And again, there will be only two players, LAs and Aguilard, and so on and so forth. Now, the law of excluded middle will now be not valid. So for instance, take some structure which has at least two elements and consider this sentence that for all x, there exists a y, which is independent of x, such that x equals y. Now, intuitively, Abelard doesn't have a winning strategy. Why? Because LAs may pick some y, and occasionally, well, it may just happen that y indeed equals to x. So she may guess, right? That's why Abelard doesn't have a winning strategy. But she also doesn't have a winning strategy because her choice of y has to be independent of the value of x. So she has no idea what the value of x is. She has to choose at random. So her strategy is just a constant. So in most cases, she will lose that play. And assuming an even distribution, if you have a structure with exactly n elements, then her chances of winning is like one over n. So Abelard is in a better position, even though he doesn't have a winning strategy in that game. So we have a gap here, right? The formula is neither true nor false. And, and of course, this formula is kind of equivalent to a first order one, but there are formulas which are not equivalent to any first order formulas, right? So the language is essentially much more expressive. So in particular, you can express hanging quantifiers within this language. Okay, now what we're going to do, or rather what we were supposed to do, well, but we will mainly stick to ordinary first order logic. Now, in his book, The Principles of Mathematics Revisited, Hintiker wrote the following. The approach represented in this book has a strong spiritual kinship with constructivistic ideas. And this kinship can be illustrated in a variety of ways. One of the basic ideas of constructivists like Michael Dummett is that meaning has to be mediated by teachable, learnable, and practicable human activities. And this is precisely the job which semantical games do in game theoretical semantics. Now, inspired by Hintika's ideas, we're going to constructivize or effectivize game theoretical semantics, but in a somewhat different way than he did in the book. Well, actually, he only sketched the way, I mean, he would like to do that. And as pretty much always, the devil is in the details, of course, especially if you're going constructive. Now, let us first revisit winning strategies in first order logic. So for simplicity, I assume that the connective symbols are negation, disjunction, and implication. Well, we will not need implication for the most part, but still. And um, we also have the quantitative uh, symbol for exists and treat for all as a shorthand. So we, ha we have these two shorthands here. One may ask, I mean, uh, whether, whether that changes something. Well, uh, so a word of explanation is needed here. So often in books on game theoretical semantics, people first reduce formulas to Prenix normal forms and then introduce game theoretical semantics. I think this is a bad way of doing that. And the reason is because, well, the, the reason is that in order to reduce a formula to Prenix normal form, you need to make sure that the result in Prenix normal form has the same meaning as the original formula. But that means that you already 
you already need a kind of semantics with respect to which they are equivalent in the first place. And that semantics should work for arbitrary formulas, not only for Prenex normal forms. So game theoretical semantics should be introduced for arbitrary formulas, not for Prenex normal forms. As for these shorthands, they do no damage. So just let, let, let us look at for all x psi, for instance, right? So what it says is the following, just let's look at this formula. So we are here, right? And uh, what happens is that first we, we see this negation, right? And it means that the current verifier and the current falsifier, they switch their roles. So the verifier becomes the falsifier and the other way around. Then the new verifier picks an X and then they switch their roles again. So what it means essentially is that the falsifier picks an X, then they switch their rows two times, right? So they're in the same position and then they play the game based on Psi, right? So it's just the same meaning we wanted to. And similarly for, uh, for a conjunction. So it just means that the falsifier has to pick one of them. Right, so now suppose that we have a signature, we have a structure as always, and we have a formula whose three variables are in the domain of our assignment. And what we want now is to introduce some sets of column terms, so to say, well, it's rather informal, but still, uh, which represent positive and winning, uh, positive and negative winning strategies respectively. So this set as plus of D, S and phi, will represent exactly positive winning strategies. And S minus will represent exactly uh, negative winning strategies. So let's see how to do that. So suppose that we have an atomic formula. So alpha is an atomic formula. This formula is either true or false under that assignment, under S. So if it is true, then let us simply assume that the only winning strategy, the only positive winning strategy is coded by zero and there are no other winning strategies. And similarly, if the formula is false, then let us assume that the only negative winning strategy is zero and there are no other winning strategies. So it's very easy. Now, what happens if we have a disjunction? Well, since we're dealing with positive winning strategies here, it's, it's our choice, right? So we are free to, to choose one of these disjuncts, right? So we pick one of them, either the first one or the second one. And if we have picked the first one, then we need to know how to win in the game based on the first disjunct. And in the second case, we need to know how to win in the game based on the second disjunct. So this union will represent all the winning strategies here. Now for the formula exists, x, psi, well, again, it's, it's, we are free to pick that x. So we pick some x, d, and then we need to know how to win in the corresponding game provided that X has been replaced by, by that element D. Well, and finally, a positive winning strategy for not Psi is just a negative winning strategy for Psi. So we just switch to S minus, which should be defined in parallel. Now for S minus, everything goes as one would expect. So let me only discuss this point because it's the most interesting one since we treat for all as, a, as an abbreviation. So suppose that we want uh, to have a negative winning strategy for the formula of the form, there exists an X such that Psi, right? So we're in the position of the falsifier here. So it's not, uh, I mean, X is supposed to be uh, chosen by the verifier. So it's not our choice. We have no idea what that X is. So whatever this X, the value of X is, 
we need to provide a negative winning strategy for the corresponding game. So what it means is that we need a function f with domain d such that for each and every element d, which is supposed to be the value of x, we know how to negative, uh, uh, how to get a negative winning strategy for the corresponding game. Well, provided that x has been replaced by d. So this is pretty much it. And the, the, what is a function here? It is the classical meaning or the constructive meaning? Yes, so for, the, for the moment, this is just the classical meaning. So if, if you want, I mean, you can replace it by a computable function or a hyperarithmetical function, whatever you want, but that will happen later. For the moment, this is just an abstract set theoretical object, right? Okay? Okay, okay, okay. yes, thank you. And now it is straightforward. So of, of course I will not go into detail here, but it is straightforward to see that there are some canonical bijections between positive negative, uh, between for instance, the positive winning strategies and uh, the elements of S plus, and also between uh, the negative winning strategies and the elements of S minus. So, I mean, these winning strategies, they directly mimic uh, these scholem terms, so to say, or the other way around. I mean, they, these elements of S plus and S minus, they represent winning strategies in a, in a reasonable way. And it will be more convenient for us to work with elements of S plus and S minus rather than with winning strategies to avoid some uh, more specific game theoretical terminology like plays, strategies, you know, and uh, now we're going to effectivize it a little bit. So we're going to assume that our structure D, here it is, it is computable, right? Well, and for simplicity, we assume that D is just uh, the standard model of arithmetic. Nothing will depend on that. Moreover, you may even try to uh, compute with uh, continuous data here and uh, use some more tricky computability, but we will go like classical, just like with Kleene's realizability or Nesson's realizability. So suppose that we have just a computable structure uh, whose domain may be identified with a set of all natural numbers. Now, and uh, right, and this D, now, now we just forget about this D, suppose that it is fixed. So we replace D by the standard model of arithmetic, again, one can do the same for any, with any computable structure D, but I just want to save some space in what follows. Now, here I will, I will not go too much into detail here, but it should be straightforward to code at least some of these terms. So roughly speaking, we want to code in a computable way those terms that may be coded, well, and those terms which may not be coded should be left with, with no codes at all. So first of all, we fix, as usual, some effective enumeration, new E, of the partial computable functions. Oh, it's supposed to be a principal enumeration so that the SMN theorem holds and so on and so forth, right? And now the idea is the following. Suppose that you have a triple of of the following form. So here phi is a first order formula, S is an assignment, and T represents a winning strategy for the corresponding game. So maybe a positive one, a positive one or a negative one, or suppose a positive one. Then E plus of S phi and T will be some set of natural numbers, which are, well, roughly speaking, this set is the collection of all codes of T. So this is what we want. And uh, using induction on the complexity of phi, you can do that rather easily. Again, since, I mean, I, I think that uh, all of us have a rather good intuition about 
how it may be done. I will not go into detail, but let us just see uh, how it may be done on some examples. So for instance here, right? So here we only have zero. So let zero be the only code of that winning strategy. There's no problem here. In the second case, we just replace S plus by the collection of all codes of, uh, of the corresponding strategies. Well, and here also. And the most interesting part will probably be here. As has already been mentioned, we haven't assumed that this F is computable. Now, let's imagine that it is computable. Then it should be replaced by some mu E such that for any element of the domain, and remember that the domain in question is just a set of natural numbers, mu E of N gives you a code of a negative winning strategy for the corresponding game. So that would be the intuition. Well, and here's the formal definition. Here it is. So we collect all the natural numbers E such that mu E is a total computable function that given N computes uh, a negative winning strategy for the corresponding game. Well, provided that X has been replaced by N, of course. Okay. So now, intuitively, if we have a strategy which is represented by some term T, it is effective if and only if the collection of all codes for this strategy is not empty, right? So maybe it is impossible to code it because, I mean, for instance, the, the function in question F cannot be computed at all. But if it can be computed, we'll, we'll find some code, right? So the collection of codes will be non empty. And uh, this approach to define an effective winning strategy turns out to be uh, intimately related with so called. Nelson's positive and negative realizability interpretation. So let me briefly remind what that is. So here is Nelson's realizability. So briefly stated, the idea of, ne of Nelson was the following. Uh, we have Kalini's realizability, right? And it's very nice in many ways, except for negation, right? Because negation is treated as phi implies bot. And that leads to the various unnatural things. So uh, intuitively, if we want to realize the negation of a given formula, what we want is to provide a counterexample. We want to falsify that. But instead, what we do is to provide a, a procedure that given a verification of phi provides us a verification of bot, well, and of course, we all expect that there are no verifications of bot. So it's just a particular way of showing that phi has no realization at all, right? And that leads to some problems like irrelevance of witnesses, for instance, or there may be formulas or with no implications, but with negations, which are true, uh, which are classically false and yet realizable, right? So that may lead to some problems. So he proposed to introduce a different kind of negation called strong negation, which just switches between verification and falsification. And then you need to define positive realizations, negative realizations in parallel, right? So here is how it is done. Oh. <clears throat> Okay, can you hear me still? Because I'm, I'm afraid that it's a bit noisy, right? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Sorry for that. It's but the same, I, the same noise is the same problem and persists, but we just got used to it. Yeah, I'm, I'm very sorry for that, but I'm not responsible for what is going on up, uh, upstairs. <laughs> um, okay, so here you, you see this 
P stands for positive realizability, and it's just like Kleene's realizability, except for negation. So with negation, you just switch to negative realizability of the formula that uh, on, under the negation symbol. Now for negative realizability, the situation is pretty interesting. So here it is. So for instance, in order to falsify a disjunction, what you need to do is you, you just need to falsify each of the disjuncts, of course. Uh, well, and similar for conjunctions, if there were any. So all the De Morgan laws uh, will hold with respect to this interpretation of negation. And you also have double negation introduction and double negation elimination, because if you switch two times, you will get to the same thing. Now, in order to falsify an implication, uh, what you need to do is you need to verify the antecedent and falsify the consequent. So this is pretty easy. I mean, falsifying implications is easy, while verifying implications is hard. It's a kind of higher order thing, right? You need a function that itself acts on, uh, on realizers. Well, and as usual, in order to falsify uh, exist x psi for each and every substitution instance, you know how, uh, you should know how to uh, negatively realize it uh, in a uniform way. Well, and what is interesting about all that is that it turns out that positive realizers in the sense of Nelson are exactly codes of positive winning strategies as we define them. And negative realizations in the sense of Nelson are exactly codes of uh, negative winning strategies as we define them. Well, here there is for some T, but in fact, this T is uniquely determined by E, S, and phi. So if you have a positive, uh, realizer in the sense of Nelson, then the corresponding strategy is uniquely determined and E will be a code of that strategy. So from this perspective, you see that even though Nelson didn't introduce his realizability interpretation as a kind of effective game theoretical semantics, it is a constructive version of game theoretical semantics. This is true for Nelson's realizability, restricted to the implication-free fragment. It is not true for Kleene's realizability, of course, because the negation, uh, I mean, the intuitionistic negation, it behaves in a different way, right? It is interpreted using implication, and it's not clear what that implication is supposed to mean in game theoretical terms. So this is already a nice thing. Now, let me say at least a few words about independence-friendly first-order logic. So how, how to do that, how to get a similar result uh, for independence-friendly first-order logic. So first of all, I mean, we, we want to do pretty much the same thing. So first we want to introduce some scholarly terms which represent winning strategies. Then we want to introduce some codes for them. And then we also want to introduce some realizability semantics which hasn't been done before. And we want to have the same connection as in the case of first order logic. Now, uh, again, I will not go here too much into detail, but the point is that it's pretty difficult to do that right away. And the reason is because um, the, the reason is that uh, independence friendly first order logic, it's kind of context dependent. So if you look at a subformula, then this subformula will have different meaning depending on uh, in which bigger formula it occurs. So it's kind of context dependent. And uh, Himtika even claimed that this logic doesn't have any compositional semantics. Now, Wilfred Hodges proposed the so-called Trump semantics for independence-friendly first-order logic. I will call it team semantics, right? So he had a certain notion, the notion of a trump, 
right? Trump with small t, but I'll call it team semantics. Uh, just not to confuse the listeners, but anyway. So he claimed that there is a compositional semantics for independence-friendly first-order logic, which looks very much like uh, Tarski-style compositional semantics for ordinary first-order logic. Well, truly speaking, I'm more on the side of Hintika here. So I, I would not call Hodges' semantics compositional uh, in, in the sense that Hintika meant it, meant it to be compositional. Because, I mean, uh, the point is that in Hodges' semantics, he just takes all the context uh, of the original formula and put it, puts it in, a, in an additional component called the team. So in a sense, he still preserves context, right? Even though the formula becomes um, simpler and simpler. Still, using that team semantics, one can introduce scholarly terms for independence-friendly first-order logic in pretty much the same way as we did it for first-order logic. So let me say what a team is. So the intuition here roughly is the following. Suppose that we have some formula and then we've reached some quantifier exists. Before that, we have already made some choices. So we have picked values for say X, Y, and Z, and now we're supposed to pick some U, right? Now, maybe that U is supposed to be independent of Y. And what it means is that this Y may vary, of course, so maybe we don't have just one assignment and we have to consider a, a bunch of assignments, but all these assignments will have the same domain. So a team is just a set of assignments that have common domain. And using these teams, you can define semantics, which is kind of compositional for independence friendly first order logic. So roughly speaking, if you have reached some team and now you have there exists U independent of X, what you want to do is for each element S of that team, you want to replace this U by some value F of S. So dependent on S, you want to assign U some element F of S. But this u, I mean, th this value has to be independent of the values that have, has, have, a, have already been assigned to the variables in x. What it means is that uh, you should do that uniformly. So f has to be kind of x uniform. And it means the following, that if you have two assignments, s and s prime, they have the same domain and they agree outside of X, right? Then F should treat them in the same way. So F of S should be equal to F of S prime. So that means X uniform. So that's roughly the intuition. And this is how it goes. So here is this. Here is this definition. So it's probably the most interesting uh, situation that you have a structure D, you have a team T, and now we have this formula with an independence quantifier. And what you want to do is you want to replace X by F of S depending on uh, the choice of S, but this F has to be uniform with respect to X, right? So if two assignments in T, they agree outside of X, then they should get the same value, right? The same value has to be assigned to them. Well, Hodges' semantics is not intentionalized. So you, you still need to do some work in order to extract column terms from that. But take my word that we can do that, right? And after doing that, Again, you will receive, you, you, you will get uh, 
two sets, S plus and S minus. Now this S plus sub star and S minus sub star. Well, star means that we're working in the extended language. Again, you can do some work uh, to introduce, well, again, elements of, of sorry. Again, elements of uh, S plus sub star will be in one one correspondence with positive winning strategies and uh, elements of S minus sub star will be in one one correspondence with negative winning strategies. And then you can introduce codes for them and even introduce a team realizability semantics for the independence friendly first order logic. So this is all very much similar to how it is done for ordinary first order logic, but you need to take care of, uh, of, of these independence quantifiers. And furthermore, this new realizability interpretation will generalize appropriately Nelson's realizability interpretation restricted to the implication-free fragment. Well, to be more precise, what it means that it generalizes Nelson's realizability appropriately, it means that there is a computable way to switch between them. So if you're dealing with a first order formula with no independence quantifiers, and you know how to positively realize this formula under each assignment in T uniformly, and you can do that uniformly, then it's also possible to obtain in a computable way a team realizer for phi under T. And it also works in the other direction. It means that if you have a team realizer then you can use it in order to provide positive realizers for phi under each assignment in T in a uniform computable way, right? So in this sense, this team realizability actually generalizes Nelson's realizability, well, for the implication-free fragment. So let me briefly sum up what we have achieved. So first, one can show that Nelson's realizability interpretation restricted to the implication-free first order formulas can be viewed as an effective version of game theoretical semantics for first order logic. Then it is possible to propose, a, it, it is possible to define a realizability interpretation for independence-friendly logic inspired by the team semantics developed by Hodges. And then you can, and of course, you can show that this team realizability can be viewed as, as an effective game theoretical semantics for independence frame, the first of logic. Finally, we prove that the team realizability appropriately generalizes restrict, uh, Nelson's restricted realizability. Well, if you want to accommodate implication, then you can do that in terms of realizability, but it's not clear what this will mean in terms of, uh, of game theoretical semantics. Because, if it, I mean, he Hintika claims that uh, implication is some higher order connective, which doesn't have any direct game theoretical interpretation. Well, of course, I mean, we, we know that there is some game theoretical interpretation of intuitionistic complication, on the propositional level, when when we are concerned with um, uh, with Kripke semantics, but I mean it's pretty far from that. Uh, I mean it, it's still pretty far from realizability, right? Uh, and there are also many other ways to go. So, for instance, uh, Hintika suggested that you may also introduce different epistemic modalities and uh, within this context and it also may be interesting also from a constructive perspective so maybe there is some work to be done in this direction as well uh, along the suggestions by Rohit Parikh for instance but anyway that's that's a different thing now 
For those who are interested in details, there is a 34 page paper on that, uh, the first one, where all the details are given and some directions are pointed out. Of course, the book by which it, it was at least partially inspired, this famous book by Hintika, The Principles of Mathematics Revisited, there are a lot of flaws and inaccuracies in this book, but it's still a, a very exciting reading. So I, I would recommend at least taking a look at that. Uh, the original paper in which Nelson's realizability was introduced is this one. Well, and finally, Hodges provided his team realizability semantics for in, uh, independence quantifiers in two papers. So one of them is this one, compositional semantics for a language of imperfect information. And the other one, I believe, is called Some Strange Quantifiers, and uh, it is published in some book, but I don't remember the title exactly. Still, uh, these references are all in, in, in the first article. Now, I think this is pretty much it. Thank you very much for your attention, and um, I'm, I'm really sorry for that noise in the background. But sorry. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and now it's open for questions. So. Please, uh, the question is now to the audience. If you have any questions, just uh, uh, yeah, just pose a question. So you can unmute yourself and just ask a question. Well, <clears throat> I want to ask: uh, After twenty-five years, uh, what is what is known about the proof theory of the of these logics? Because most of the works I've seen I have to do with the semantics. Was there, uh, what is known about proof theory? I think that uh, there is very little to know about proof theory for that thing. Well, especially because a lot of work has been done by, by students of uh, Yauko Vanenen. Uh, I don't know if, if, if I pronounce uh, the surname correctly. So it was mostly on the model theoretic side, even the set, set theoretic side, I would say. Um, of, of course, I mean, there are some nice fragments of independent, well, so there is so-called propositional independence-friendly logic, right? And uh, it can be axiomatized. So, so there are some nice decidable fragments for that. You can also try to do some uh, work on guarded fragments uh, for this logic, and that they may be axiomatized in one way or another. But I think that apart from that, uh, a little is known, and uh, it may be a, a, a nice thing to try to do because, I mean, in the following sense. So uh, it is known that independence-friendly first-order logic has essentially the same complexity as, uh, as uh, the existential fragment of second-order arithmetic, right? So essentially sigma 1-1. One, one. So you can try to do some Hankin models in this context and to try to see what they correspond to in the in game theoretical terms. So may, maybe you will not have all the games, all the strategies, but still, I mean, may, maybe restricting the notion of strategy in a certain way, uh, you'll get something interesting. It's ju just merely a suggestion, but I think it might be interesting to do that. Uh, but otherwise, I think that there are only some fragments which are very close to, to, to the guarded fragment of first order logic that have been investigated and that can be axiomatized. Apart from that, most of the work is on the model theoretic side. And uh, uh, what I find unfortunate, even on the model theoretic side, that it seems that no one has looked on uh, formal theory of truth, like Kripke's theory of truth in this framework. I think that would be particularly interesting, especially because Tarski's undefinability of truth theory entails. But again, I'm, I'm not aware of any work in that direction. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, there's another question, I guess, by Sergei, please. Uh, yes. <laughs> the realizability semantics, which was uh, almost closely copied from the original BHK semantics, has uh, three or two and a half problems, and uh, uh, one and a half of which you mentioned. So that's the negation problem, of course, that's an irrelevance, and then you can uh, if you do realiza realization uh, by the usual realizability approach, uh, then we can realize formals which are classically false. 
and uh, realizers become irrelevant and all other things. Well-known problem with negation. A little bit more analysis, a little bit deeper analysis shows that, of course, this is a reincarnation of a deeper problem, which is, uh, so it's one half of the deeper problem, which is the problem with, with implication. Negation is implication to falsum, and uh, um, so the, the negation problems were inherited from the problem with implication. And mm -hmm. uh, this is what really prompted Kreisel to do his research and to come with what is called Kreisel, so what is called now Kreisel's second clause, uh, uh, which actually addresses the issue, um, uh, at least at the informal level. And there is a third problem. And the third problem is this, this universal quantifier. And that's what I'm, uh, I want to ask about, because it's my understanding that Nelson, um, the dual approach takes care of negation somehow. Uh, the implication, if he's talking about the clear team realizability is out of the picture, you don't consider implication. Mm -hmm. What about universal quantifier? It's well known that universal uh, the constructive reading, BHK reading, constructive reading, universal quantifier is also a thing. So um, it, it requires that there should be some procedure or computable function, which given uh, F, uh, if you want to realize for all X, F, F of X, you have to provide a function which uh, gives you the witness or the proof of the witness F of A for each A. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can easily sell uh, how we call it in New York, the Brooklyn Bridge under this, uh, under this, uh, under this umbrella, uh, you can uh, sell that the, the, some fake solution of the last Fermat theorem would count, uh, would count as a constructive proof of the Fermat last theory. Well-known Schwitzenberg example, which I read in the eyes, I heard it, and uh, this kind of well-known problem with the universal quantifier. So the question, since implication is out of the picture, negation is taken care of to some extent, I'm not asking about it. Do you, or does the team semantics actually takes care of the uh, Kreisel second clause, or at least with this uh, um, problem with universal quantifier, with realization of the universal quantifier? And to what extent, if yes? Um, well, it's a rather general question. Uh, so um, it, it will, will require more time to think about that. But in my understanding, well, the, the short answer will be no. So uh, I, I believe that uh, the problem will still arise and in order to get rid of it, probably what Hintico was thinking uh, of is to introduce some additional like epistemic model operators that may help yeah, I understand. to, to that, deal that, with that, these things. Right, that, that, so that, that, I, I think that the problem will reoccur in this context as well, right? Very good, very good, very good. I'm, I'm happy with the answer and the reference to Hintika because that, this was my observation. So if you, if you try to do it uh, only uh, or realize or to realize BHK uh, fairly in only on the basis of computational functions like clean style and uh, all, all the, the children or grandchildren of this approach, you're not gonna succeed. You need an epistemic notion at the moment. Yeah. Uh, which, so, yeah. Good, good, I'm, I'm glad. So, uh, so some, somewhere in the last chapters of his book, I think this is the main reason why he uh, introduces an additional model operator, right? Good. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Yep, please go ahead. Am I right that this is a special case of a partial order to, or Henkin uh, quantifier? Uh, well, I, I believe that, well, I think that Henkin quantifiers can be modeled within this framework. So it should be more general than that, but they can be modeled here. No, right? it should be more general the other way around. Uh, because, because the Henkin quantifier allows you arbitrary partially ordered sets of independence and alternating quantifiers, so. Um, well, well, maybe they have like the same complexity. I mean, because, well, it yes, is- they do. That... I mean, there is a theorem by, by Aaron Voigt about this complexity, but I just wonder, I mean, there is a paper in 1961 about Henkin quantifiers, which, which discusses the model theoretic aspects and the decidability aspects of it and then then people kind of dropped it 
Well, I, I think that it has reoccurred recently. Though people mainly use not this independence-friendly logic, but a variant of it, which is called dependence logic, introduced mm -hmm. by Yoko Venemy. But it's known that it has exactly the same expressive power. So it's just the same thing under, uh, under a different title. And I believe that it will have like the same complexity, right? I mean, if you consider arbitrary Hanky quantifiers. So at, at first I thought about this just like four things, this two to two matrix. Well, if you consider arbitrary quantifiers, probably it has the same complexity. Uh, I would guess that. Okay, thank you. But uh, we have now uh, four minutes before, um, well, in my, in, 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 again, it's now four minutes